start. Great. Welcome tonight, everybody. Um, really glad to see um, everybody here and thank you for joining on Zoom. This is a rather special evening because we've never really tried this before with a panel of speakers who we're, yeah, we're going, we're going to be introducing Paul, Paul Palsland Rajpuri. Helen Cornish, if you come here, is my co-facilitator tonight. Um, and I'm going to ask Helen to introduce our first contributor. So thank you. You've got a thank speaking you. camera. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to be here and it's so nice to be taking part. So thank you for um, setting up this really interesting collaborative event. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversations and all of our participants. So the first, our first speaker is um, Paulina von Hellemann from Goldsmiths University, who is an environmental um, anthropologist and, um, and, and works on political ecology. And a lot of her research recently has been doing to, to do with the cultural history of palm oil. But today, Paulina, I think you're going to, to give us a general um, introduction to some of the themes that we might want to think about today. So over to you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, shall I do? How do I do? So I just do square. Um. Oh, Paulina, I need to make you co-host, and you can share yes. the screen. I'm sorry because of being late with that. We can do that. Oh. I think it'll happen. She shares screen and Paulina will come in. You should be co-host now. Um, it should let you share screen. Okay. Have I done it now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so just, can you hear me and shall I just start speaking? Yes, yes, you can, we can. Sorry. Okay, rather disconcertingly, I can only see my own screen, but it's okay. I'll do it this way. Um, so thank you so much, Camilla, for facilitating this. It's it's really great. Um, uh, Helen and you and I have been talking about this sort of subject about how to bring in um, to talk to um, to think, starting to think a bit more about um, local environmental knowledge here in the UK. But you have now put this on the map, and we're finally actually having an event about it, which is great. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to kick off by really starting to talk about, um, as you can see from my title, what role can anthropology play in bringing marginalized knowledges into regenerative futures? I, I was putting together the title for this this morning and realized it sounds very much like an essay question, but it's, uh, I thought that would actually work quite well because I'm the, the approach I'm taking, it's sort of really an open start to think this through, but I'm very open to, um, everyone um, contributing and I haven't got a programmatic view of anything at all. I'm just sort of putting in a few things I've been thinking about. Um, and yeah, before I start, I quickly wanted to say something about my title page here, the illustration of uh, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. I put it on here because it was published 50 years ago and I'm trying to use 2023 as a year to kind of um, bring it in whenever it makes sense. And I think today um, that it does make sense to mention it, but I also particularly like the cover of this version I have here of, uh, as you can see, uh, the new world is almost born. I do, do do like this very much as a cover. So I thought it would fit, set the tone for this. Um, so yeah, so I will, in the time I have, and I will try to stick to it, uh, just talk about three things, where we are at um, in now and in time, and then how other, older forms of marginalized knowledge can help, and then thirdly, the role anthropology can play in this. So in terms of where we're at, um, we've all been talking about it and uh, where I don't really need to say it, but we are in a time of poly crisis, not just climate and biodiversity, but also spiraling inequality, health, energy, and of course, democracy as well. Um, and it's, there is, it's not just that we are living through this time, which we all know, but also what I've been noticing is that we are increasingly recognizing more and more of us what is really behind this, which is basically the, that it's the result of 
the kind of dominant mode of how we've been living, living or what we've been doing the last 300 years or so. I am now, you can call this colonialism, capitalism, or both together, or I also very much like Nancy Fraser's uh, cannibal capitalism as a comprehensive overall term. But for the purpose of today, I also think it's quite useful to think of it maybe just in terms of, or more broadly as modernity, because it's, of course, it's capitalism and extractivism, but also bureaucracy, enlightenment, technology, it's a sort of wider phenomenon and, and most of all ways of thinking. And all of this is really being called into question now. Um, I was really struck the other day on within two days, I listened to two podcasts. One was Outrage and Optimism with Christiana Figueres talking to Johan Rockstrom, where they were talking about the problems of silo thinking, of enlightenment thinking, and how arts and sciences have been separated for so long uh, in a very, very matter of fact way. Um, then on the same day, I listened to Accidental Gods, which I, by the way, I also really recommend as a really great podcast to think things through or how to do things differently. Um, she, she was doing an interview with uh, Paul Raidasse about Excel sheet thinking, uh, where he was talking about this as a major problem today. And then also, actually, my parents of all people on the same day or the day after called me to say they've just been to a talk by Ernst Ulrich Weizsäcker uh, where he was talking about how really uh, the massive amounts of damage that the Enlightenment had caused. Um, and I was, may, I am very, very aware that all this is, of course, is very niche and more or less coming from the same quarters and that I am myself very receptive to all this. Nevertheless, I do think there is a wider change. That these sort of things were not talked about so much before. And I do think there is, there is a bit of a shift. And that's also in things like the huge popularity of, for example, Braiding Sweetgrass by um, Robin Wall Kimra or Jason Hickel's uh, Less is More. And also a, a kind of overall recognition that we do need to rethink how we've been thinking about nature culture. And I've noticed this very much when it's one of the lectures I give in my environmental anthropology module and realized I had to teach it very differently this year just because it wasn't something that was sort of new and I had to talk people through we were all almost already on the same page in terms of recognizing that the kind of division of nature culture doesn't really work anymore and is and is being questioned and that there's so many different ways of thinking about it. So I do feel all this is changing. And of course, there is also so much kind of transition underway already with all the permaculture projects, regenerative farming, transition towns, and then of course, donut economics or um, this size one planet living etc. There's so many different ways, projects that are starting and also so many individuals who are themselves in different ways organically choosing life. Um, and part of this, what is very, very important in all this, of course, is that we really need to start imagining that we cannot really get to a different future if we can't really imagine it. And so that's something I've become really interested in. I didn't used to be, but I am now um, I'm interested in, the, uh, for example, the idea of the symbiocene, a, a term that was um, by the philosopher Glenn Albrecht, that after the Anthropocene, symbiocene of, of, of living together, nature, culture, symbiosis. Uh, also, of course, solar punk very much and the sort of really innovative, exciting eco-socialist thinking going and positive thinking going into that and more widely science fiction. Uh, I'm, I've never used to be now. I really like it as a genre, and I, yeah, I, I read quite a lot now. But um, and but overall, we just really need a sort of much more long-term thinking. And um, by that, I very much do not mean the kind of long-termism of uh, Elon Musk or others who are envisioning a future on Mars, or that that sort of thing is not what I mean. I just mean in general overall long-term thinking like sustainability or the, the sort of how to be a good ancestor or the, the kind of uh, commissioner for the future that Wales has recently um, uh, installed as well. The kind of thinking that you do think about the future and future generations. Um, but at the same time, it's not just really being able to think about the future, it's also thinking about the past in a different way and, and in general thinking about the future, uh, both the past and the future. Um, because I do think actually presentism, this sort of tendency to only think for the one or two generations or even shorter electoral 
cycles um, or in terms of history only, modern history, history of nation states, that is actually a real major flaw in, in modernity as well as the other things I mentioned before. So I am also think just as we are having to imagine a new future, uh, kind of drawing on different kinds of marginalized or older forms of knowledge can really, really help in, in many different, for many reasons. Um, first of all, we know actually that they work uh, for, you know, in 300 years, modernity has destroyed more or less everything. Before that, for hundreds of tens or hundreds of thousands of years, people did leave, live um, successfully. And I uh, recently did a whole uh, sort of 52 post long thread on Mastodon about all the different examples of how uh, what is called um, intermediate disturbance kind of lands different ways of using uh, farming, lands, uh, forestry and pastoralism together have been developed throughout the world and they basically work. And there are examples of this throughout the world. Uh, secondly, we may not actually have that much choice if, if we do, or once we do reach a stage where the, the larger complex systems that we rely on now collapse, then we, we do have to just do things in the kind of way that how they used to be done in the past. Um, thirdly, there's also, there's some real issues in terms of equity, uh, or it will also address equity and distribution issues um, and because to recognize that the kinds of knowledges that we already have have from those that have so far been marginalized. Um, I don't have much time now, but I wrote a sort of slightly weird blog about this the other day about what really the kind of dominant knowledges that operate and have shaped the world are really a tragedy of the non commons because they go hand in hand with inequality. Um, and then fourthly, of course, why it's important to draw on existing knowledges it's because transition is so much easier if we draw on what is already there and it is already there so and that will it i i do think that's important that we don't all have to become completely different we just have to rediscover the things that are actually um in in all of us and that's uh that's why i do like the or i've been thinking about a lot the title of uh, bruno latour's book um we have never been modern um because and I'm sort of using this for the, this slide, um, because I think it's all of these knowledges have been, they're not just in different parts of the world everywhere, but they're also here and in us, in our landscapes, uh, in our stories and in our museums. Um, and by that, I don't just mean here in the UK now, I don't just mean the, um, the kind of sort of old English folklore kind of stuff, although that as well, but I also mean uh, that's why I'm using, in fact, the word marginalized knowledge, because really there's quite a lot of different knowledges that exist and are here, but that we never really draw on in any way. Um, and that's why I'm not saying indigenous or local knowledge just now. Um, and that is in relation to all the different kind of diaspora national communities we all have here as well. Um, and I just, if I have two seconds, I want to just quickly tell an anecdote. I was in an Pit Rivers event, or an, an event outside the Pit Rivers Museum as part of activating the archive, where we wanted to show people different kinds of African grains. We lost the sorghum we had, so I quickly walked to Cowley Road and to one of those shops there, and I found everything I needed, and uh, the sorghum was there, everything, and the whole store we did with these, what to people maybe seemed like exciting things, really just came from 10 minutes away. And it really, I just, to me, that was a sort of one of those moments where I suddenly, I was then had to think of uh, China Mieville's book, uh, The City and the City, where you have two cities living in the same space, but they never meet and they don't know each other. So um, I just thought all this stuff and knowledge is just here, but we don't, the kinds of people who might just stop at Asta all the time or something, they don't even know the other worlds that are possible and that are right here. Um, and of course, what we do have is, um, so I'm not saying I'm the first one who's interested in all this at all. We have lots and lots of projects nowadays. Um, the Activating the Archive one I mentioned just now, but also the British Museum has this um, Endangered Material Knowledge Program. Um, uh, there, there's lots of interest in crafts and in, in different kinds of skills and of course uh, permaculture, all these things. I, I myself recently did an extremely good uh, basket making workshop where I made a basket like the, on the picture here. Um, 
there was also a reason just at the last, I think, two weekends ago in the Observer, I just happened to see an article about the re new interest in medieval medicine. And then just last night, I came across an, a really interesting article about, um, by, by chance, I wasn't, I was just, I came across it about a new project where old canoes, Salish canoes are being rebuilt, so starting to build again in Seattle as a way to kind of reconnect with all the existing knowledge. So all this is, and I'm sure you can all think of many, many other examples of all this happening. But I still feel there is a role that anthropology can play in this. And that's what I just wanted to end up talking about now. Um, first of all, I feel, given this is the sort of thing we work on in many ways, we can really help with really thinking through the politics of all this. And um, because of course, there are sort of a lot of pitfalls or difficulties um, avoiding romanticization. I mean, I think I'm slightly prone to it myself sometimes, but at the same time, um, you know, how to, you know, that we're not just imagining an ecologically noble savage, uh, but uh, sorry, that's a sort of term we sometimes use to describe this romanticization. Um, but that we also avoid nativism, the kind of, it's not about, you know, I had have no nationalist or any kind of those sort of things in mind. And very much also the problems of appropriation and all the politics around indigenous knowledge in general. Um, this, I don't have time to look into, read it out now, but the box here on the right is from the article about the Salish canoes, which points out that all this is very well, but in fact, the rights of the indigenous people living in this area have never been recognized. Um, and they were not even invited to the sort of creating this setup of this. So there, if you do it, you do need to do it well. And there are lots and lots of politics around this, but we need to, um, we can help with that, I feel. I know a lot of people say anthropology itself is the problem and should go away, but I do think we, having had lived through all this, oh, we, we can potentially help. Um, secondly, uh, uh, also, I am also interested in thinking through, or as part of this, the commonalities of of different kinds of environmental knowledges around the world. So, and this came out of this uh, historical ecology thread I did, um, where just looking at everything together, I was really struck by, for example, living fences in Ethiopia, but also here in the UK, or, or different kinds of soil enrichment practices, strikingly the same in West Africa or in Amazon, and then here as well, you have these sort of night soils. And more, there are examples throughout the world. And I think that is actually quite helpful to see that actually, to, to see that we all have it, we still have it in different ways. Um, and I might, I think I will, I'm hoping to do an, uh, a special issue around this. Um, and then of course, we have lots of different kinds of ethnographic material that can be used. It's all there, like in archives and books. We might as well, to use Elizabeth Popinelli's phrase, sort of mine anthropology for, to make the best of what there is especially given all the problems in the history of generating this knowledge. I think there's a sort of possibly restorative value in using it. Fourthly, then we also can, and we should, but for doing all this, we need to become much more outward looking and engaged and practice oriented, um, writing in different ways, doing more events like radical anthropology, of course, is a great example of not just speaking academics, speaking to academics, but we need much more of this. And I'm, trying at the moment to set up an MA in regenerative anthropology in practice um, at Goldsmiths. And if this works out, the idea is to kind of use anthropological knowledge and insights to then help in the kind of transition that we, we need to be doing. Um, and then, of course, we can also do a lot more research uh, uh, the, of the kinds of things I've been talking about. Um, for example, recently, I just started talking to someone who might be doing a PhD with me about Caribbean herbal knowledge um, and those sort of things. So we, but I am also open to suggestions. Uh, sorry, that's what I meant to say. It's, that's what we're doing here for, to, to uh, find. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you. That, that's fantastic coverage of the ground. And I, I should say that really um, the inspiration for trying to bring this panel together has been uh, from Helen and Paulina especially. Um, and I thought, yeah, we could do it here at Radical Anthropology. Um, we're going to go straight on to our next speaker who's live. Um, Raja, you can come up. And if you're all right for standing here, 
So uh, Dr. Raj Puri is Senior Lecturer in the Environmental Anthropology at University of Kent, um, has long-term fieldwork with um, Rainforest Penan in Borneo on their ethnobiological knowledge, um, as well as consultancies in many other cult countries, um, but has recently been turning attention to European contexts of change in rural landscapes um, and um, thinking about how does anthropology bring to bear on climate science. So hand over to you, Raj. Um, are you able to okay. speak there? And are you OK there? Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Well, good evening, everybody. I, uh, Paulina has kind of stolen all of my good ideas. Um, no, I uh, thought really my comments would be a little bit more sort of personal uh, in terms of my engagement with uh, various kinds of political uh, and environmental kinds of movements over the years. And I've been thinking a lot about how we as anthropologists engage uh, with various groups of people that we end up uh, living with, working with, uh, writing about, making films about, uh, and what that means for them and for us as anthropologists as in terms of sort of our identity. Um, and I suppose I should just ask everyone here, how many of you would consider yourselves an advocate or advocacy anthropologists? I'm not sure if I know what that means. Well, I mean, say, okay, let's say uh, an advocate would be somebody who takes a stand, not necessarily does research, but perhaps uh, goes on a march, perhaps testifies uh, in a courtroom, translates documents, legal documents, makes counter maps, that kind of thing, yeah? All right, good. <laughs> Sci well, science petitions, why not? I mean, yeah, an activist, advocate, activist, yeah, it depends on the kind of language you're using, but yes, yep, okay, good. Good, so everyone is on board here. Does anyone feel a bit nervous or uh, reluctant? to call themselves an advocate anthropologist or an activist anthropologist? Just a radical anthropologist. <laughs> I know, I, I just wanted to make sure who my audience is here. <laughs> I think you just want to work out in the context of how you're applying anthropology, like that was the, that was really what, what you were advocating for, because that's what you're doing. Well, yeah, I mean, some people do feel, you're right, there is there certain contexts where we feel perhaps more comfortable I mean, that was one of the early lessons that I learned uh, as a graduate student when I started an NGO, an environmental NGO uh, in Hawaii, uh, ostensibly to work on conservation, rainforest preservation kinds of issues. And, um, and then joined a, a group of native Hawaiian activists who were protect, trying to protect their forests from geothermal development. Uh, and my little university based NGO got involved with them. And we, uh, being, in Honolulu, as opposed to the Big Island, where much of the, the um, intervention was happening, ended up in uh, the state legislature, writing testimony, uh, giving speeches, organizing protests, having meetings with the governor, et cetera, et cetera, and getting quite involved in, in this big campaign uh, that had fairly large demonstrations with lots of people getting arrested, making the front pages of the New York Times, uh, and so this was all very heady kind of uh, uh, stuff to be involved with as a graduate student. Uh, and it was, but it was very easy to get sucked into um, and find oneself uh, really uh, going way beyond what was kind of expected of an academic anthropologist at the time. Uh, but I found it very, uh, very rewarding. Not only did I make very good friends with uh, Native Hawaiians and uh, come to understand much better the situation of their lives, the sovereignty movement in Hawaii and the links between sovereignty and environmental protection. Uh, but I also learned a lot about running an NGO um, and working with fellow students and others from the public who were interested in this issue. And I think the first thing uh, I realized that after making many mistakes as we all do is that you know, people have very different levels of commitment 
Um, and amongst my anthropology colleagues, I would say over the years, I found that they sort of fall along a spectrum from wanting to do good anthropology uh, and produce knowledge uh, and understanding, interpretation. So I would call that a kind of scholarly role to some that are more interested in, in education, uh, going beyond just the education of universities, but perhaps training, uh, capacity building, these kinds of activities that some of us get involved with. Uh, and then onward to more roles as kind of a mediator, uh, serving mediation, either translator, interpreter, or literally mediating diff between different kinds of parties. And I've been involved in that between indigenous communities and say conservation NGOs or government departments. Uh, and that's, you know, that's still one tries, one is sort of put in a neutral position in those kinds of situations as a mediator, but it's still gone several steps down the road towards activist or advocacy anthropology. Uh, and I'm thinking of the roles of people like Stuart Kirsch and others who really uh, pretty much left anthropology behind to advocate for indigenous peoples in mining cases and, and legal issues and land rights cases. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that that's fairly takes a lot of commitment. And some people would say that, you know, that crosses the line, uh, so to speak. Um, and one's objectivity as an anthropologist perhaps is compromised in those situations, if that's important. But this subjectivity, objectivity, uh, issue really becomes quite clear in these kinds of situations. Um, after that, working in Indonesia was a very different situation, working with the Penan in Borneo. The Penan were involved in blockades in Sarawak to protect their lands from loggers. Uh, that wasn't the same in Indonesian Borneo and Kalimantan where I was working, uh, but there were other issues uh, associated with, um, with land rights, um, uh, non-timber forest product collecting by outsiders, et cetera. So people were still trying to protect their lands and their resources. It was a little bit difficult to get involved in the way I was in Hawaii. I wasn't, of course, an Indonesian citizen. Uh, I was uh, on a permit. I could be thrown out at any moment. I could be blacklisted. Uh, it was a very different kind of role that I had to engage in as a researcher and potential activist and supporter of the communities I was working with. So that was sometimes very difficult kinds of situations where we were um, in various cases sort of confined to quarters or put under house arrest uh, over the years working there. So there, it, it was not quite as, as simple as working in your own country where you have kind of uh, rights and protection somewhat from, from the legal system. But so working in those kinds of situations, very different context uh, for engaging in sort of activist anthropology. Um, we were involved in a project there called Culture and Conservation in the early 1990s, was trying to pioneer the ideas that through, uh, through um, helping communities to revitalize uh, their cultures, to maintain them, was a way to maintain the kind of uh, strong ident cultural identities and feelings of pride about one's communities, lifestyles, and places and that that would inevitably lead to more support for conservation. At least that was some of the ideas of how to integrate uh, these two aspects. Uh, and that also, again, challenged notions of sort of objectivity. And we had many debates whether or not it was important to do research first and then activism, or one could do both at the same time, uh, and which would be more effective in our arguments. Uh, it was certainly the case in Hawaii, where say the, I don't know, many of you have heard of the Hokulea, speaking of canoe building, very famous uh, rebuilding of the Hawaiian uh, long distance voyaging canoes in the 1980s, led by Ben Finney, uh, anthropo economic anthropologist, um, you know, had this massive effect across the Pacific of revitalizing not only knowledge about navigation and about canoe building, but in general, supported a Pacific wide revival in, uh, in, uh, in culture, in native languages uh, and practices, et cetera. Uh, in, in, uh, in Indonesia, we, it was a small project, it was, uh, but fairly successful. I think the most important thing we did is we had 
young people from the communities who finished high school or going to university come back and do studies of all the different kinds of practices uh, in their communities that were disappearing from pottery to basket making to hunting to fishing uh, to traditional Belian or song cycles, uh, et cetera, and uh, filming, recording, and producing kinds of archives, archival materials. So basic ethno ethnography that uh, we felt was really important. And um, that whole that idea kind of harks back to George Appel. I don't know many of you may have heard of George Appel, an anthropologist who worked in Borneo and founded the uh, Urgent Anthropology Research Fund, which the RAI has been sort of a holder and disperser of fellowships since the 1990s. Um, and George Appel was very much a sort of, some people would call a legal anthropologist, but really he was an anthropologist interested in the rights of the communities we worked with uh, and very much pushing the, um, the line that uh, securing land tenure for indigenous peoples was probably the most important thing we could do. Uh, in the long term to promote self-determination. But he also argued against intervention. He was very much against uh, development interventions. And in fact, wrote a very famous essay called The Pernicious Effects of Development, uh, kind of uh, recognizing the complexity of social and ecological systems and saying, how, how can we uh, push, change, intervene without understanding what's going to happen? And so very reluctant to do that. But what he did advocate was really good ethnography for communities, that the best way to help people was uh, to provide them with that kind of cultural knowledge and uh, not, well, traditional knowledge, but even contemporary cultural knowledge that uh, that is disappearing. Um, and by doing that, we give people the tools, the resources to uh, to build futures, to be more resilient as, as uh, change occurs. Um, so I'm, I, I think that's a, an important lesson to remember. And I think for those who feel, who feel unable to say, walk a picket line, get themselves arrested, uh, or, or, uh, or you know, challenge people uh, on, even on social media, um, that doing good ethnography as anthropologists do, is still an extremely important contribution to the future going forward. Um, how much time do I have left? A couple of minutes? A couple of minutes. OK. Uh, another incident from, uh, from Vietnam, where uh, I was asked to uh, do a preliminary study on a new protected area in, um, in, the, um, in the Anam Mountains, just south of Hanoi. and. Uh, we were asked to find out what would be the impact of local people on a new protected area. And we thought, and of course we thought, well, that's rather strange. What about the impact of the protected area on the local people? So we did a little bit of counter, sort of counter research, counter mapping there to try and convince the World Bank uh, and others that uh, in fact, the protected area was going to have really um, quite uh, important impacts on local people's ability to use resources to promote their traditional practices, such as traditional house building, traditional funerary practices, et cetera, uh, the harvesting of snails and other kinds of um, natural uh, non-timber forest products in those limestone mountains. Um, and, and so that was a bit of sort of counter mapping done uh, in, in uh, using research, but also advocacy in our documents and our uh, seminars and presentations to uh, conservation agencies. And I think they, um, they, they took a different view after this project um, towards uh, communities. Uh, I think there they were worried about communities' abilities to protect their own lands from outside forces, which is a legitimate uh, concern. But I think they uh, overestimated the impact that local people were having on the community, on the forests around them. And finally, most recently, I've been working in India, um, in, uh, in the southern India, looking at invasive species and how they've been impacting local communities of Soliga and Lingayat peoples um, who live in the, the mountains on the border of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And these communities are pretty poor subsistence farmers, very much dependent on government handouts and uh, being squeezed from all sides. Um, and also having uh, much of their young population you know, leaving uh, 
as we find all around the world, including in Europe, rural flight. Um, and there, our, our mission is sort of to, um, to try and bring local people's knowledge and experiences of how they're dealing with invasive species and the effects on their communities to upward from the bottom, from the grassroots up to decision makers and conservation agencies in India and abroad, uh, and to try and uh, begin to sort of make, uh, you know, make these voices heard in these conversations. Uh, invasive species are just one example of biodiversity change that is happening all around the world as a result of climate change and other kinds of uh, impacts of, uh, of development and urbanization, et cetera. Um, and so trying to understand how local people are dealing with these kinds of impacts now is extremely important. Uh, and here we're fighting that age old uh, notion that somehow uh, rural, poor rural farmers uh, are victims uh, of, uh, of environmental change and uh, have no agency and no ability to react and change uh, as, as we have, are seeing in these areas. Um, and so again, it, another kind of role is serving kind of as a mediator uh, uh, and trying to, in this case, we're trying to convince the forestry department to allow for trials to demonstrate traditional use of fire to manage forest landscapes, which has been fairly successful in Australia. But the Soliga have a very old tradition of burning the forest undergrowth every year in January, just before the dry season, uh, to promote growth of herbs and grasses. Those understories of those forests are now choked with Lantana camera, terrible invasive species. And they claim that they can control that invasive species if they're allowed to burn. Uh, but convincing the forestry department to allow people to burn their forests is a tough task. Um, okay, so. But that's a few things I wanted to say. I hope that was interesting and stimulating, and I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That that was such a um, overview, quick tour of so many different levels of uh, intervention. Um, we're now moving into the activist sphere with Paul Palslin. I just want to say how you know amazingly thrilled I am to meet Paul. Um, I first realised what he was up to with this uh, spread in the Guardian on um, the the river roading should be a sacred being, and Paul is goes between has kind of this trickster like manifestation of going along with all the knowledge of legal rights of nature as a lawyer of the rights of nature, goes along to try and persuade the police or the feral developers that actually this river or that tree has rights and should be protected. And then when they don't listen to him, he jumps up the tree or prevents the river from being desecrated. So yeah, yeah, Paul, please don't go into the Thank you for that introduction. That was lovely. I was actually going to say I was feel really nervous coming on after some credentials academics, where my main qualification seems to be being a bit eccentric and being one of the few people. You're behind the camera. So. One of the few people. It's really bright though. Um, one of the few people who. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> well, we've got. Let's Sorry. Get, let's is there a way to do this? Right in there. There we go. We. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Anyway. And being one of the few people who um, who live in the middle of a, site, a tidal salt marsh in London, um, that seems my main qualification for being here, but I'm going to give it a go. So um, there are two main things that came together um, to bring me into this world of, uh, I guess, local nature protection activism and all of the rights of nature things that go with that. And they both happened six years ago, and I didn't realise when each of them happened, they were going to lead into the same sort of area, but um, I'll tell you them briefly. In February 2017, um, I wrote a very last minute pro bono legal advice for some tree protectors in Sheffield who were trying to save thousands of their street trees from being chopped down. Um, and actually, completely surprisingly, the advice actually worked and the police listened to it for once. They never normally do that and backed off and the trees didn't get chopped down, which was great. Um, and I became this sort of go-to barrister for a number of years. And from that, other different tree campaigns got in touch with me. Oh, by the way, I'm a barrister in my day job. Well, it's just that at the start, confusing otherwise. 
Um, and um, other tree campaigns got in contact with me and I realized that there is a huge level of destructive attitudes towards nature that's being done in this country um, as kind of late stage capitalism enters its kind of death throes. Um, nature is being destroyed at an alarming rate. Trees, rivers, wildlife habitats, all of it in the UK, which is already one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. And I realized the need to change the relationship between law, lawyers and nature. So I founded Lawyers for Nature as a group to try and offer um, support to local communities that were trying to protect nature and then instantly became completely overwhelmed by the level of support that is needed and realized that actually in my spare time, I just didn't have the capacity to offer that support to every campaign. So I've tried to offer sort of broad high level support to campaigns. So general advice to them, but also to change that relationship, to fix the underlying broken problem that we have in this country and which we have exported around the world through English colonialism, which is this, seeing nature as a dead resource to be exploited for human ends. That is the underlying crisis. That is the crisis which is causing all of the other symptoms from the climate crisis to soil destruction, to forest destruction, to um, soil depletion, the problems of the water cycle, pollution, all of it. That is the underlying issue that we have. And it started here and we helped to export it around the world. And so we need to end that attitude here I believe, in order to begin solving all of the crises which Pauline alluded to in, in the first set of slides. So how, how do we do that? Well, one of the things I'm looking at is rights of nature, which is this idea that nature should be given legal standing and rights to bring, bring legal cases and also to be given guardianship. And it's happening all around the world um, in lots of different ways. And the one that I'm most interested in is the Wanganui River in New Zealand, which by way of an act of New Zealand Parliament in 2017 was given its rights, given self-ownership and given a guardianship body. And of course, New Zealand has a very similar legal system to the UK. So there's no legal impediment why we couldn't have the same thing for our rivers in this country. But of course, what's the main difference between England and New Zealand? It's the existence of the Maori people. And around the world, we see that rights of nature and an, an attitude towards nature of seeing it as alive as a being to be respected rather than something that's dead to be exploited, largely coincides with those who have an indigenous voice in their societies. So I realized that actually we, we were gonna struggle in this country to change the law um, without changing that underlying relationship, but that's very hard to do in a country which is not only the most, one of the most nature defeated on earth, but was one of the first on earth to be colonized and to be disconnected from the land over a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago now. So coincidentally, back in February 20, January 2017, so a month before I did that advice, I didn't see the connection at the time, um, I was being hounded off the Canal and River Trust waterways by tedious bureaucrats who were demanding that I move 25 miles in a year rather than 15 miles in a year um, and hassling me with um, uh, yeah, people coming around to my boat because someone in the office in Milton Keynes had noticed on a spreadsheet an Excel spreadsheet, almost certainly Pauline would say, <laughs> that I wasn't moving far enough. And I had a choice then, I could either move on to land, but I didn't I really want to live in a house particularly, or get a very expensive mooring in London, they're about 10 to 20 grand a year, just for, the, just for the mooring. Or I could do something completely ridiculous and get a map of London and work out if there were any rivers that no one was doing anything with and see if I could just move my boat there <laughs> and see what happens. And I looked at a, a map and most rivers in London are either gone entirely, the fleet is entirely underground, the Tyburn's underground, many of them are truncated like the Quaggy, um, some like the Wandle is still above ground, but there's a weir right near the entrance you can't get in, and some like the Darren are big enough but a bit too far out of central, particularly when I live in Dartford. And there was one that caught my eye, which is the River Roding, uh, which is the third biggest river in London. Who's heard of the River Roding? Well, that's not. You don't count, Harry. You know? <laughs> that's that's kind of normal. I don't, I don't know how much of that is through the, the trailing of this um this talk, but yeah, it's generally no, not many people know of it. But it's the third biggest river in London after the Thames and the Lee, um, and flows down for about thirty five to forty miles from near Stansted Airport into the Thames in Barking, and on its lower reaches there were big uh, houseboats on the creek, but in the river part above Barking Town, no one's ever lived there. 
there was no navigation authority in charge of it and the river was a kind of forgotten post-industrial mess and I thought that's a perfect place to be. <laughs> uh, so not really knowing what I was doing I moved my boat there um, and spent six months being terrorized by local kids who thought I was a weirdo and they they weren't entirely wrong about that, but also <laughs> they, they didn't deserve to be terrorised for it. Um, and then had the idea of setting up a project um, that would avoid the worst excesses of the Canal and River Trust, which were, as I see it, sort of very bureaucrats who are far removed from what's actually happening on the ground, trying to direct things across an entire country without having any local knowledge or placement. And so I set up um, a charity called the River Roading Trust, and we uh, lease the river from the Crown Estate because it's a tidal river, it's owned by the Queen um, and the Crown Estate. And then the charity then rents moorings to the boaters. So I encourage other people to bring their boats, which was slow at first because everyone was like, what the hell is this? It's a bit weird. Uh, but has now picked up. Um, and the money, so, and it's a combination of the cheapest moorings in London, but some money and then uh, one day volunteering a month from the boaters for their mooring to improve the river. And it all goes directly back into the river. There's no salaried staff at all. So literally we just spend all that money buying trees, benches, tools, that kind of thing. Um, and we've had results. Um, but those results have also been, um, have also taught me things over time and taught the rest of the trust things as well. So we began with litter picks and trying to take all the rubbish out of the river. And when you do it once, you think, ah, this is just the build-up from years past. It's fine. It's going to be better in the future. And you come back again a year later, and it's exactly the same again. And a year later, it's exactly the same again. You realise that actually this local knowledge isn't enough. You have to then campaign for changes to the whole packaging industry. The entire way our society yeah. deals with packaging and waste. And we can't just keep picking it up. Mm. But also, it gives me a really valid and angry right to speak to those fucking companies who dare to make profits out of just producing waste they know is going to end up in the river and for me to say i am not your slave why don't you come and pick up this crap or stop producing it? Yeah. and i get angry there right because i feel it because they're hurting my river the river that i love and that comes through i'm not just like an angry tedious activist going oh you want to change the system it's like i want to change the system because you are hurting my river and i am trying my best to stop that hurt, but I cannot deal with it against the systemic conditions that you are creating. And the same thing with the water companies, right? If you, we, we all know about the sewage crisis, but unless you actually really feel it because you see something that you love being destroyed, I don't think it cuts through in quite the same way. You can talk about the water framework directive and the sewage laws and Thames Water and their shareholders, and we all know it's awful, but I really feel it. And others who really care about the rivers really feel it. And that comes through to Thames Water. Um, in addition as well, you can have all the, all the laws that you want, but actually if they're not um, upheld, then there's not much you can do. So for instance, on the roading, there were a number, how long have I got? One minute. Another minute, okay. <laughs> finish, finish. Yeah, okay. Um, on the roading, um, there was an illegal sewage bill happening that, we, that wasn't even known. So it was, it was definitely illegal. It's a criminal act that no one was even checking. And we happened to go past, we were doing a volunteering day that day and saw it. And if we hadn't noticed it, probably it had been going on for months, it'd probably still be going on now because no one, the environment don't even check anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's all these laws, but what's the point if no one can see it? So I regularly walk the river and, um, and check. The, the only one that does so in London's third largest river. The, I'm just me in my spare time just being like, oh, there's some sewage going in here. It's madness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the, this idea of like deep, deep nature connection. And like I was walking along the river uh, a, week, a couple of weeks ago with a poet and there was an area that I thought sewage was coming into, but I didn't know. And suddenly I heard this rumbling and they pumped it out in one big go. And I got a video of it and went on Twitter and it got a couple of hundred thousand shares all around the country. And immediately the next day I went back and Thames Water were pumping the sewage out and taking it proper, proper treatment, right? That's the power. And if I hadn't been walking there that day, it would still be happening now. And just to bring those two threads together very quickly, if I can have one more minute. <laughs> What it's teaching me is that there is a real space for the role of indigeneity. Maybe we want to call it something else to avoid that word. In this country, we, we can't treat obviously indigeneity as a noun because we, we don't have a people who belong to these lands specifically anymore. But I think there's a real important place for the role of it, making indigeneity into a verb, into something you do, 
a relationship that you have. And that relationship being open to anyone from around the world, no matter what your passport says or where you were born, do you wish to have a relationship with these lands? Do you connect with them? Do you spend time with them? Because that's often crucial, is what I noticed on the roading was that being on the river led to a, a deep knowledge of it. And that, without even trying, led me to a deep love of the river that developed from without me even knowing it. And again, the final stage was that love, without me really knowing it, brought me to, as you probably saw a moment ago, I talked, spoke about the rubbish in the sewage, a deep, not desire, a, a, a deep need to protect my river. And that, for me, is that role of local knowledge and care and that role of indigeneity that we need to bring back. Because I think without it, we're going to struggle to achieve those bigger changes on a political and legal level that we need to avert the crises that we face. Thank you. Oh. 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 Yeah, <laughs> Magda, can you share your screen if you're gonna? Do you want to introduce? I can do. It. Sure, sure. Oh, well done, Magda. Helen is going to introduce. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, it is. Oh, pin you pinned up or you'll pin Magda up. We'll pin you up, Magda. So, well, you we'll decide to let you do that. <laughs> Great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Can yes, we can. Yeah, we can see um, we want to see you. I think that's. I think that's okay. okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, well, thank yes. you. This is. So you have that's you, and then me. Magda will comment okay. when she speaks. When she speaks. Okay. So our next speaker is Magda Vukcek, Dr. Magda Vukcek from the Humboldt University Berlin, um, who is involved in uh, a lot of research around these, you know, these issues around material culture and um, decoloniality and thinking about how to work through environmental questions. She is the co-chair of the Traces Research Project, which is the agenda for climate change, tech studies and social justice. And so I'm going to hand over to um, to Magda with this wonderfully enticing um, title, The Mouth and the Mountain. Magda, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen, and thanks, Paul. This was really an inspiring uh, talk. And what I will do here is to perhaps try to talk a little bit about a, a different connection with water and the landscape. And I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So let me start with a short story. In 1931, Antonio Gramsci wrote a letter from prison that included a story, a tale of a mouse who drank milk that had been prepared for a sleeping baby. So the baby wakes up and finding the glass empty starts crying. And the mouse goes to the goat to ask for some milk. It feels very sorry for what it has done. Unfortunately, the goat has no milk because there is no grass. The mouse runs to the field and the field is too parched. The mouse goes to the well, but it has no water because it needs repairing. So it proceeds to the mason who hasn't got the right stones. And then the mouse goes to the mountain, but it finds that it has been devastated by deforestation. So desperate, the mouse tells the whole story to the landscape and promises that the baby, when they grow up, will replant the pines, oaks, and chestnuts. Convinced by that, the mountain donates the stones, which are given to the mason who repairs the well, and so on and on and on. So the baby has plenty of milk to sustain its growth. So when the baby becomes an adult, they plant the trees and everything changes. The land becomes fertile and regenerated. And I start with this tale of the Italian philosopher, journalist, and politician to think a little bit about this relationship between people, animals, plants, but also between growth and regrowth, scarcity, and abundance. 
So Gramsci was born in a village on the edge of Monteferro Hills in the western part of Sardinia. So this is the region we are talking about. And can you see my the correct? Yeah, we're on your title. Okay, okay. We have a different. We have a different uh, slide online, I think. Let me just have you have you got the um, top with the arrows? Can you move it forward with arrows or with the? We're not seeing your move. Okay, let's have a look. Sorry. Can those who participate online see the map? I'm still seeing the title. I'm no, just the title. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me just try to do that. If you if you make it smaller, maybe it will move forward. If you come out of full screen. Sure, sure. I was trying to. Okay, let me just do that. Maybe we can do this. We've what? got the map. We've got the Excellent. map. Excellent. Great. Sorry about that. Right. So, so Gramsci was born in a village in the region of Oristano on the edge of the hills in Sardinia. And here you can see this western part of the island. And then let's hope this will work. Sorry about that. Perfect. The slopes of the Monteferru, you can see them in the background on the right, are in this picture, but we will stay in the flatlands of the province. Several rivers flow from the mountains into the plains, creating a network of freshwater marshes, lagoons, and drainage canals, all flowing into the Gulf of Oristano. And they are part of the globally connected Ramsars, or ecosystem that are key nesting sites for migratory water birds. So you can see the little map here. And I, I believe that there is a Ramsar waterscape in London as well, in Wolfhamstow. So the plants of this aquatic landscape, like the spiny rush, or what Italians call it, junco, and the giant reed, or canna, the tall ones here, are vital for the fauna, flora, but also key to the prevention of coastal erosion. So the wetlands and their ecosystems are also of great importance as it's projected that by the year 2100, the water levels in Oristano might rise up to 84 centimeters, hugely affecting the area. So I came to think about the relationship between people, animals, plants, and the landscape through things, baskets made with junco and canna that I was researching as part of an ethnography of the collections in a Berlin museum. And this was a kind of multi-sided patchwork ethnography of material culture of weaving that happened to take place during COVID. So it was in different ways affected by the pandemic and continues uh, in patches until today. So revisiting the sites from which the collections were acquired in year 31, and you can see a picture here taken by the collector, I met with a number of makers of objects today. And I learned that due to environmental protection measures, access to Junko and Kana is currently restricted. However, the basket weavers do not consider themselves as causing scarcity or depletion or ecosystem imbalance. They see plant collecting as multi-species collaboration. So they feel that one needs to be attuned to the plants as you can only collect them at a particular point of the year when the blades are of specific flexibility, not too young, hard or dry. And the tall sticks of canna are obtained only once a year at a specific phase of the moon, and the process involves walking carefully between the bird nests and pulling just a few bits from each plant. So one maker explained that the collecting of junco is a bit like gardening, as it involves pruning, collecting seeds, and then spreading them around so that the plant grows better and more abundant. So the practices of using communal lands to collect and garden the waterscapes in their view, contrast with the emergent models of wetland protection. 
So with the threat of climate change, local authorities and or environmental organizations want to pre prevent sourcing plants from those marshes and the lagoons. And as an alternative, a recent international environmental project proposed what they call a sustainable development cooperative. So the project would buy land in the village and plant junco so that the basket makers would then make objects from the material. The only condition would be to make a collection of more modern designs once a year that could be then sold as sustainable heritage in places like Milan, for example. Yet the basket makers very quickly rejected the plan to set up a cooperative. The project staff said that the weavers were suspicious, backward, and did not understand the need for initiatives aspiring to build a sustainable future. And here I quote one of the um, staff from the Environmental Protection Project. They feel there is somebody always going there to take their knowledge, land and stuff, get rich with it, and they don't get the recognition what they've done and who they are. They are always somehow afraid of sharing. A sustainable design specialist within the project said that the basket makers kept asking her, are you going to sell them for thousands or show other people in China how to make these baskets and then we will never be making them again? So for her, the environmental priorities did not come through. All of the actions were driven by fear. The weavers were reluctant to share as they already had an experience with co-op production run by designers. This initiative collapsed in the 80s, leaving many out of work. They understood the politics of value, of turning their craft into design and creating added value that would never trickle down to the maker. The new co-op was set up with two designers, two e-commerce specialists and a journalist, as one of the weavers emphasized, all of them being from the outside. The three basket makers who were initially interested in joining were supposed to be producing objects, as they said, to pay a salary of nine. The weavers felt that the environmental project seems to have completely misunderstood the very core of the relationship between people and plants. The material could not be obtained from anywhere just like in the case of Foundation's plan to create this wetland plantation for Junko. They also felt, sorry, that there was a whole privatization project going on and they rejected the privatization of the landscape because they wanted that people in the local area have a continued access to communal marshes. They explained that plants could not be cultivated as they differed depending on time, season, position in the waterscape. The traditional ecological knowledge of the weavers entailed, for example, careful maneuvering of these conditions through collecting. The plants are not just some raw material or commodity that is then made into an object, but they're companions that might have their own character. And you can talk to people about, you know, how, for example, with this basket, the, the junco is stubborn, it's collaborative, or it listens or it doesn't listen to the weaver. So the cooperative set up by the environmental project lacked this embeddedness in the local knowledge and missed the embodied ways of communicating with the plants. So increasingly, the makers find themselves in this kind of catch-22 position. On the one hand, it's illegal to collect, but you don't really want to work with the alternatives provided by such projects. Meanwhile, the project of the cooperative ended, and if the makers signed up for it, they would no longer have any support from the foundation. So you really have to also think about the temporalities of environmental project, the protection and the kind of projectitis of these kind of initiatives and think about their afterlives as those who are affected by these initiatives bear the consequences of discontinued ideas. For the makers, the cooperative was also predicated on the idea of growth. 
it was supposed to always launch a collection each year and scale up production to be sold on the market to make the co-op financially viable. It was linked to sustainable tourism, etc. But the weavers were not interested in this kind of growth, which poses very interesting questions about the ways in which environmental practices might be actually embedded in the logic of private property and the politics of value in the capital scene. The anthropologist Tracy Heverington, writing on the establishment of a park in the Sardinian mountains, reminds us that globally oriented environmentalisms are rooted in Western ethnocentric, Christian, modernist, romantic, and liberal aspirations. She identifies that many of the activities are part of global dream times of environmentalism, rendering nature with a capital N as sacred, timeless, universal, global, and always at risk. These dream times in very different ways intersect with different projects and life projects of the people on the ground with different conceptions of place and ways of living in the environment. And for me, the story of the weavers shows that while the environmental projects run by the members, for example, of the activist communities, aim to protect the landscape, and for example, in this case, intangible heritage, they lack intimate knowledge of the place or the relationships. So they transplant very often the scientific perspective, for example, on the Ramsar management plans from the elsewheres, tools that are seen as rational, neutral, and independent of place. Paradoxically, they might also be driven by the logic of growth and upscaling that drives the capitalist processes which led to scarcity in the first place. So this is my last slide. Sorry about going a little bit over time. One more minute. Okay, so at this stage, I would like to return to Gramsci's story and think a little bit about a different system of gardening, knowledge making and growth in which we could take seriously the possibility that plants, people, and water might speak to one another. I would like to ask whether a mouse could give life to the mountain, or if apparently anachronistic or obscure practices like basket weaving in Sardinia or collecting rushes can play a wider role in environmental protection of waterscapes. So I would argue with Tracy Hetherington that we need to be aware of the implications of this museum effect and consider how places are separated from local use through environmental activism. What knowledges and relations might get overlooked and suppressed? What assumptions are being made when we think, for example, about collecting? Is it really always about accumulation, hoarding assets and degradation? So the stories of environmental futures might not just be set by international cooperation and global environmentalism, but by local, apparently minuscule and scaled down praxis, practices. So perhaps, I don't know, like a mouse, we can learn from the weavers, listen to the landscape differently. Maybe they can even tell us other stories about preserving and regenerating the landscape and about collecting, planting, quiet as a mouse, slowly and carefully navigating the space and its multi-species companions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Magda, for that really introduction to kind of intricacy of connection in local specific landscape. And um, I now want to invite uh, Richard Jones, our last contributor, we've rather overrun, but um, Richard's got, uh, is an, a, a professor of landscape history at University of, of Leicester and is giving us a, a broader interdisciplinary perspective um, with his fascinating studies of thousand year old place names and the linguistics of these place names as a repository of traditional ecological knowledge. And I'm sharing the screen and going to be doing the slides for Richard. So Richard, come, I'm just going to do that. Thank, Thank you very much. It. Uh, oops, I'm you? absolutely in your hands, but whilst you're, whilst uh, you're sorting that we'll out, manage. I think we'll manage. <laughs> can I just say um, how, how delightful it is to be part of this conversation? It's been, been fantastic so far, and I hope not to let everybody down at the end. Uh, so as you've heard, I'm a historian, and so I'm interested in knowledge that has been marginalized, to use uh, Paulina's term, by time. 
Um, and I, I'm interested in how we can retrieve this and uh, apply it to contemporary environmental challenges in practical ways. My focus is, is very much on the, on the UK. So when we think about repositories of deep time traditional ecological knowledge, tech, born out of long and intimate engagements between communities and their environments and shared across generations, our thoughts are inevitably drawn to indigenous, Aboriginal and First Nations cultures where scientific, uh, Western scientific and philosophical principles have yet fully to intrude to reorientate worldviews. The notion that tech could survive in the West seems antithetical among a raft of factors which have broken the fundamental relationship between people and place, we might note increasing population mobility. People rarely stay in one place across their lifetimes. Or wholesale landscape change, driven by a range of socioeconomic factors, which has meant that the structure and fabric of the land, together with its flora and fauna, has been reconfigured over the centuries and often many times. And of course, the great, if flawed, intellectual shift of the Enlightenment, which turned its back on and indeed sought to eradicate old ways of thinking and introduced the overarching paradigms which have shaped the failing experiment of modernity. It's a depressing picture. But if the majority of people are now rootless and increasingly unfamiliar with their immediate environments, there are remarkable, albeit fragmentary, survivals of millennia old tech which continue to communicate to us if we know where to look and bother to stop and listen. Some of this knowledge, some of the most powerful in fact, and of potentially incalculable value to us as we try to navigate through the environmental challenges of present day climate change, is hidden, hidden in plain sight. It survives because it has been encoded into place. And since places are intrinsically more persistent than the churn of people who have successively lived in them, it has proved remarkably tenacious, despite the comings and goings of people and the loss of collective memory. Among these survivals are place names. And I want to offer here some reflections on the tech contained in and communicated through English place names, the great majority of which were coined around a thousand years ago. More specifically, I want to lay out why I see them as a vital tool for addressing what has been described as the UK's most pressing climate change induced environmental challenge, that of flooding. But first, some very brief introductory words on place names. In origin, most place, English place names began as meaningful phrases, which sought to describe something of the defining character of a particular location. In short, the function of a place name was to actively communicate information rather than simply offer a passive, if convenient, label for the identification of a geographical location. Many of these names took their cue from the nature of the local environment, its topography, or the dominant forms of land use, open or wooded, cultivated or wild, for instance. Next slide. Among these, no environmental theme is more dominant than water. The number of English place names which communicated information about the local presence and characteristics of water and watercourses run into the thousands. They tell us about channel morphology at specific points on a river's course. They tell us about flow velocity, depth, the quality of the water, the nature of the riverbed, and the nature of the floodplain. Together, they map riverine environments and hydrological processes in extraordinary detail. Next slide. Running them a close second in terms of number are those which describe trees and woodland. We'll return to these in a moment. But for the time being, we might note the well-established relationship between trees and rivers that lies at the heart of natural flood management strategies. Trees intercept water, particularly rainfall, increase the time it takes for water to enter into our river systems, and by so doing, reduce peak flows and the likelihood of down, downstream flooding. Next slide. 
we might identify four reasons why historic place names remain such a valuable tech resource. The first is their geographical specificity. They describe their immediate environment. Secondly, and relatedly, is their geographical stability. While names can migrate over time, rarely do they move far, and certainly not beyond the area in which their reference is meaningful and understood. These combined facets ensure that whenever a name is encountered, we can have a high degree of confidence that it informs on the past environmental conditions that prevailed in that precise location. Next slide. The third aspect of note is the specificity and range of vocabulary found in place names. Old English was rich, richer in fact than modern English, in terms available to be used to describe the specific characteristics of a watercourse or a stand of trees. This vocabulary was assiduously deployed, the namers of place alive to the nuanced differences of each feature they named. Next slide. To take one example, among the water names, there is a small group which contains Old English wasa. These occupy similar topographical locations, albeit on different rivers. All are locations that were and remain prone to flooding. Now, other, river term, uh, other flood terms were available to place namers, but these were seemingly ignored or deemed inappropriate in these places. So what sets Wassa locations apart from other flood areas? And what did the term Wassa denote in terms of local water behavior? It would seem that both in the past and still today, the onset of flooding occurs rapidly and alarmingly in these places. And that here, the relative water level rises are higher than on other parts of the river. Wassa names then are warning names places where the threat of flooding once needed to be taken seriously and which remain at risk today. Next slide. But of all the aspects of place naming which demands our attention in the context of modern climate change, it is the climate context in which they were first coined that should catch our eye. Most English names formed during the last significant period of rapid climate warming on historical record that is between the 8th and the 10th centuries AD. This was a period of extreme weather events, high precipitation and flooding. Does this sound familiar? Indeed, it was during these centuries that today's floodplains began to develop and formalize. So if we're looking for parallels with the present, then it's not to the 17th and 18th centuries that we should go, or to the scientific observations made at, the, at this time. Rather, we need to go back a thousand years beyond the scope of scientific records and instead draw from the ecological wisdom left by our supposedly unlettered early medieval forebears and place namers. For they were observing rivers and watercourses behaving in a very similar fashion to those that we encounter today and were wise enough to record their observations in the names they gave to their settlements. Next slide. I believe that the detail these names provide about the nature of rivers and watercourses in their pre-engineered states, and what other names tell us about floodplains and, the wider river, and wider river catchments more generally, including where trees once abounded and where natural wetlands were found, might provide templates for future river restoration, re-meandering and rewilding that will help slow the flow. So let me offer you one example. This map shows the catchment of the River Erewash, which forms the boundary between Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. The river name itself is interesting, morphing over time from a form which indicates uh, a, quite a benign river to one which was clearly angry and flood prone. This state change appears to have occurred relatively early and may well have been encouraged by significant woodland clearance in the middle catchment. This is indicated by clear, the clearing name, Leia. What I've attempted to do here then is to reconstruct the early catchment environment at a relatively coarse resolution 
through place names. As a starting point for discussions on rewooding this catchment or restoring natural wetlands to store water, I think what it, is, it shows deserves serious con uh, consideration. It shows a catchment in a more naturally balanced state, one with the capacity to intercept or soak up water and reduce the likelihood and magnitude of fu future floods. Final slide. Such an exercise can be re repeated elsewhere. And even if localized flooding is not a serious issue, the exercise has potential value for re-engaging people with their local environments. Here, and for the benefit of Paul, of course, is a rapidly put together map of the river road in catchment. <laughs> it shows the broken nature of woodland in the catchment a thousand years ago, areas of moor and heath, as well as open cultivated ground. Restoration of woodland and moor in the headwaters, watersheds and on the tributaries where they once were found would have a significant, significant in, impact on water flow and quality. This map reveals too just how prominently the river and its feeder streams once registered in the minds of the communities who lived along the river, who adopted place names which spoke of water's importance. The identities of these communities were shaped by these watercourses. How differently we would view and treat our rivers if we were to do the same. And what powerful tools we would have at our disposal in our efforts to curb the rising flood threat resulting from climate change today, if we once again looked to place names for advice. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, I think you get the prize for being on time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's well, been very yeah. hard to. <laughs> the only reason I was, because, as you saw, is because I wrote my script to make sure I was. <laughs> well done. That's a lesson to us all. Um, so that that was a, an absolutely fascinating overview from people at, at this intricate local level and this historic perspective. Um, as well as the bigger overviews from Raj and Paulina um, there. We're now going to open to discussion and points from um, both the room, and I think Helen's going to be in charge of chairing the room. Well, yes. One thing, was Harry here? Did Harry turn up? Harry, do you want to have a little bit of a spot? Um, we haven't got loads of time, but I did want to invite Harry from right to Rome. Do you want to come up, actually? to say a little bit, um, and then we'll open to the whole floor. Um, we will, I'll try and pick up chat. I'll, I'm gonna put you, oh, well, actually, if we, oh, I want to speak of you for you. Yeah, take me Can off the screen. Please intro yourself. I'm, fi I'm finding that very, very weird. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm now finding, to, I've finally managed to get rid of Richard. Oh, no, <laughs> now you're all right, Great. but I'm going to blank this. We're going to go there and that so that you're right. Yeah, that's it. There was a funny sort of tunnel of infinity point, which was quite funny. Yeah, it was. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having me on. So, my name's Harry. Um, I have the honor and privilege of working with Paul at the Brighter Rome campaign. Uh, I forgot to mention that whole part because I ran out of time. Yeah, yeah. So, the Right to Rome is a campaign that we founded in 2020, uh, trying to uh, campaign for free, fair and informed access to nature and uh, a national right to roam as they have in Scotland. Uh, and it's something that, um, that Paul and I work with and it's really good fun and I hope everyone can get encouraged to get involved and get involved with your local right to roam group. There's one in London and uh, we have them around the country now, it's just great. Uh, my background is actually in environmental anthropology uh, and in indigenous rights uh, campaigning and sort of indigenous rights solidarity. So I thought I wanted to briefly talk about why Sort of, I think there's been two worlds in my head. There's been that world, and then there's been the world of right to roam. And it wasn't until very recently I began to realize how these relate really and how they're very, very similar in, in many respects. Um, and I think fundamentally it comes down to the idea of, of what is a right to roam, what is human beings' connection with nature. I think the right to roam is a is a human right. I think it's a fundamental thing we as humans have. We're we're a nomadic species, we're a migratory species. We we've always been in 
Um, I works quite a lot with, with hunter gatherers and, and the nomadism is an incredibly important part of that. And the reason it is, is because if you stay in one location for enough time and you deplete the resources and you overhunt it, you're not going to survive. You don't respect nature, then you won't, you won't survive in it, as a lot of people here will, will know. Um, so some of the research, most of my research has been in Papua New Guinea, but some of it's been in, in Greenland, so Kalafi Mna is the Inuit Pulit. And uh, I was looking at how Inuit are reclaiming a conservationist narrative. They've been treated terribly by organizations like the WWF and that kind of thing. And this horrible fortress conservation that, um, that Raj was, was just talking about that happens in protected areas. And they're reclaiming an area between Greenland and Canada called Pekialososua, which basically is a, an area they want to reclaim and, and totally control uh, for, for an Inuit-led conservation um, scheme. And as part of that, they want the right to migrate and they want to be able to cross the border, recognizing that they never crossed the border in the first place, the border crossed the Inuit uh, between Canada and Greenland. And they say the only way they can properly look after species and monitor things like oil and, and uh, illegal fishing and all of this kind of thing is by being able to move and being able to roam about. Um, it's a fundamental thing that indigenous peoples everywhere do, like, like Paul and others were talking about, it's because they're connected to nature. If you are connected to nature, you will understand how to live in it. If you're not, you, will, you won't survive. Um, how does this apply in the UK today? Um, it's the same, exactly the same principle. When human beings are disconnected from nature, we won't survive. And I think the crisis we have of biodiversity and climate is one of disconnection. We, we, we are so disconnected from, we buy our food in, in plastic packaging and that kind of thing, but it still is ultimately coming from the same nature that hunter gatherers are getting their food from. It's just the levels of destruction are so vast and we don't see what's happening. But like Paul was saying, if we if we would concede the destruction, we wouldn't be doing it basically. So I think that's one of the reasons we did form the right to roam, whether we knew it or not, was, was to do with the fundamental idea of human right to, to access nature and to be part of it. And uh, I hope very much that in order to be able to reconnect with nature and, 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 and it's, we will move ourselves forward in, in, in doing so, and be able to care about the environment a lot more. So please do get involved with the rights room. It's really good fun as well as um, being, I think it's important <laughs> that we all do. Mm. Um, I, I got in touch with uh, the Red Thunder Project group a few months ago, last mm -hmm. year sometime, because I began to realize we did a dark skies trespass. Um, mm -hmm. I had the idea of doing something where we could get access to a dark sky and we could look at the, the moon and the stars and thought about what that might mean to us. And then I realized, hold on a minute, I, there's something anthropological about this. Why are we doing this? And uh, I think it's a human need, basically, to be able to access. And as we all know, there's, there's many ideas about the moon and about the dark skies of us looking at it. So it's really important, I think, that we will have such rights and we can learn from indigenous cultures and we can learn from, from everywhere to, to really reclaim that connection with nature and to use environmental anthropology for good things and, and not for, for terrible things that a lot of anthropologists use for work for mining companies or whatever. Being an activist anthropologist is the way to go. Um, so I hope you can do that and don't work for money companies, but do something good. Yeah, do the right Thank you. It's back. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Um, do you want to chair the yeah, room and I'll see if there's a, take, um, one, phone. yes, um, it may need works. to switch on. And it goes the other way. Yeah, it's green, we'll maybe that will work. Um, there's also a, um, a list, if people could pass that around the room for emails. Um, could, thanks, Harry, if you could put that to go around the room for anyone who wants to put their email on. If you've come through Eventbrite, we've already got your email. And the purpose of collecting that is to, if there's any kind of follow-up coming out of some of this discussion tonight, that we'd be able to inform you and tell you about it, um, which we hope we're going to be able to generate. Um, let's try to get some contributions. Yes, does anybody have a... And we've got cast. We've got Zoom, but anybody who's yeah. in the room first, and then. Anybody has a comment or a question for any of our amazing speakers? This has been such a um, wonderful. You've already had a go. Yeah, no, no. You did. You were just test. Yes, <laughs> you tested it. Yeah. 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 So actually, all I want to do is share a little bit of information, which I'm not sure. People are aware here, and it's specifically Portugal. And Portugal was recently 
about a year ago, the first country in the world to um, grant final um, status to the environment. And um, I, I had the pleasure of meeting also a lawyer in Portugal who started this movement about five years ago because he realized in order to actually be able to have any impact and make any changes environmentally, the environment itself would have to have a legal status in order to be regulated and protected. And so he started this movement in Portugal in the University of Porto to um, get um, this legal status for the environment. He actually managed to do this in Portugal and the, and the environment is now a legal entity by law in Portugal. And so I wasn't sure if people were aware of this, but mm. just to know that, you know, what you're doing, there's other people in other places also mm. fighting this fight. Mm. Um, Fantastic. And yeah, I, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. And Zoom, a... can you hear what's being said? Can you hear it? Yep. Yes, I can. Yeah. yeah, and there is a website if you want to know, it's common home of humanity.org, and that will tell you all about that project and the law and etc. Coming home of humanity.org. Yes, common home of humanity. Common home, common home, yeah, coming home, home. common yeah. home. <laughs> and yeah, it's, yeah, it was quite a fit, and obviously, as you can imagine, this was a very long. Um, legal battle. I was actually, you know, in the Portuguese Parliament when this was passed in law. Um, it felt like it is. Yeah. Um, we've got Catherine Williams. Catherine, can you unmute? Yes, I yes I can. Uh, bear with me. I don't know if you can see me as well. Yeah, dinner, yes, so I hope. Okay, so 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 uh, it's just whoever was um, facilitating the chat just asked me to speak aloud a comment I'd I'd put in the chat. Really interesting talks, really exciting and interesting. I'm a master's student in medical anthropology, by the by. But I was raised as a historical geographer, and I became perhaps not surprisingly a property lawyer because I'm interested in in land ownership and rights. So it was really just. Um, a comment to flag, I'm, I'm really interested in things like a right to roam, and I don't know how it works in Scotland, but my point in the chat was that for more than a thousand years in, in England and Wales, we have total ownership of land, and, and that needs to be part of the conversation when we think about things like right to roam, because all land is owned. And I was also making the point that what's often spoken about on the news, nobody has mentioned it today, but you'll see people say on the news or on the newspapers things about access to common land, as if they assume that we've all got a right to go on something called a common. Well, we haven't. A right to go on a common is a specific land holding right to go and graze your pigs or something. On a, on a common. So it was just a flag that added complexity that I think the previous speaker speaking about Portugal was in, in a way possibly alluding to that, that there are many intersecting legal rights here. And in England and Wales, we have this total ownership of land effectively, uh, and that needs to be part of any thinking on these issues. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that was like a direct point to that, which is yet yeah, that. That, come, come in. That, that does exist, but also we mustn't allow it to over to, to stop people taking action themselves. Um, the River Rogan Trust now has a lease of the river, but we don't have any permissions for any of the work we do anywhere else. I literally just go onto other people's land, put in benches, plant trees, and dare them to stop me. And I think sometimes <laughs> if, if, if we worry too much about this total land ownership, go and do good things, protect your nature, and dare them to stop you, because they know they'll look stupid if they're trying to rescue you for planting a tree. My no, reply no, no. to that would be, well, OK, if I, you might not mind if I come and squat on your boat or camp in someone else's garden, but other people might. So intersection of rights and what you think is a good and other people think is a good, maybe different thing. So it, it's not that simple, I'm afraid. Right. <laughs> You want to say who you are if you want to say who you are. Thank you very much. My name is absolutely Butcher. I have to say, I'm blown away by everybody's there's talks and discussions. So I just wonder if uh, we're working on quite uh, similar stuff, trying to bring awareness because although 
we talk about um, sustainable and not buying things from packaging, it's important that the majority of the people associate with economic divide, divide um, and often got people can't afford not to eat uh, food like that. And how do we make a change and how do we help um, a lot of people with the new information, the new understanding we have of biology? And how do we kind of um, legislate um, that waste and organic waste needs to be treated correctly in order for us to bring um, soil fight processes back into neighborhoods for us to be able to showcase um, this incredible technology that none of us know anything about, even though there's libraries and books out. Um, and yeah, it's, it's um, I, I have taken over millions of spaces all around Toronto. <laughs> and so I do believe what you're saying is um, absolutely do it, do it better. You've got the right to regenerate, you can do a job better than they can, prove it and win, win that space. Um, and and obviously, yeah, so, um, after doing that, the council has now granted me um, a seven and a half, a half thousand square foot basement to open up the first um, city soil lab where we can actually showcase this uh, precision fermentation of local biology in order to recompose materials that we are actually wasting at present. And I need somebody to help me legislate that. <laughs> so um, um, I'm very happy to hear your story. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions on Zoom? I haven't got hands up. Are you in the room? Or if the panel wants to comment, or anybody on the panel wants to comment. Oh, another question. Um, I, um, I have a question for um, any of the panel speakers, but um, I mean, I came up with this question when Polly talked to you, so I guess. Maybe she wants to answer, but there's obviously the call for making room or moving over for marginalized knowledge of First Nation knowledge and um, indigenous, indigenous knowledge. Is, um, but I agree that marginalized knowledge is a very um, appropriate term. But just wanted to ask um, Does the global north deserve the gift of marginalized knowledge? And if so, why does the global north or how does the global north? earn access or earn the right to be able to access and use this knowledge because maybe we need to think about whether the global knowledge deserves to be able to use the knowledges that after the history that they have experienced of kind of being erased by neoliberalism, by capitalism, by colonialism. So yeah, just wanted to ask that question. Did the panel, did everyone hear that? Does anybody want to comment to that? Anybody on the Zoom? Does the Global North deserve the knowledge? Paulina? Yeah, I, I think I did hear, yes, thank you. I did hear most, I couldn't hear the previous speaker very well before, but um, I, um, yes, I think, I mean, that's a very, very good point. I, and yes, I, I do know where you're coming from. I mean, I'm sorry, I've, I'm, trying, I'm struggling to find the right words. I think it's, um, yes, I mean, as you said, the, the, the sort of constant, the sort of extreme ability of, of capitalism or neoliberalism to co-op or to co-opt and absorb and make everything its own is, you, you see it all the time in every, in every way. And I think, by the way, Magda, you're I know that's not exactly what you were talking about, but nevertheless, that I was really struck by how much your project spoke to what I was talking about in these really sort of global, imprecise ways. And then you just got right to the nitty gritty and how then, you know, you have this project where people are trying to do like a really good thing and and then it it isn't, it doesn't quite work. So, uh, but yes, what your question there, I think, and then of course you do have the the larger, huge question of, Justice isn't even quite the right word, but given given the whole history of of everything that has already happened, it's I think it is a good question. And I'm also remembering um, I once went to a very good talk by Elizabeth Povinelli, which was about these sort of issues, and she was talking about the um, sorry, I've slightly forgotten this. Uh, is it, I think Flint or something like this American town that had this huge water crisis where people yes, had Flint, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, but she said in the end, she said, so justice isn't just about people being paid or something like justice is actually re reverse the tap. And I thought that was sort of that I've never forgotten that because 
It is true. It's not just then, oh yeah, let's, I mean, I'm, I wasn't even actually saying that in any way that it's, I don't think it should be about, so there are massive, so it shouldn't just be about now that we, if we all work together, then we can all have the same, given that we here in the North have had so much more for so long. I, I think you're right. It's maybe we don't deserve the solutions that other people have. Um, and we, we deserve to perish or I don't know, but um, it's, uh, it, I, <laughs> I, would hope, I would still hope that there is some way to, um, sorry. Is there any, any other panelists, Paul, do you want to say yeah, something to that? Do you want to come yeah, in here? Maybe we, come should, here. we shouldn't steal other people's knowledge, but we also have our own, right? Like yes. every, for every single niche that exists all around the world, there is a plant and some form of knowledge that fills that niche. And actually we don't, we, we shouldn't be taking things out of people from the Amazon anyway, because that doesn't work in our niche because it's a different plant. Like in this country, we have a magic regenerating plant that builds land out of water. That plant is called willow. You can literally take a branch off it, stick it in the ground. It will grow into a tree. I've planted about 500 of them all along my river and learn about, and you can build buildings out of it and weave baskets out of it. And it produces aspirin um, yeah. as a pagan. And, we, and for every single little niche like that, we've got our own. And our job is to relearn what those are for these lands, because that's where, that's what we need to know. So actually stealing it is A, immoral, and B, doesn't even work half the time. <laughs> can, can I just, sorry, I was actually going to, yeah, thank you. I was just, it's fine. I, I won't speak yeah. anymore. I'll do it later. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, LT, LT. LT, yeah. Do you want to speak, ask to, un, uh, can you unmute? Thank you. Hi, hi, I'm Leila. I can't, I don't know why I can't change the, um, anyway, um, thank you so much to all the speakers as a non-anthropologist. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I lead uh, Friends of the Welsh Harp, which is a local wetlands group for the Welsh Harp. It's called the Front Reservoir. And Paul's journey, I couldn't believe my ears. I literally wrote this thing. I did an MA in psychoanalytic studies last year, and I literally wrote this in my MA. And I was like, wow, this journey of connection and the love and walking and seeing things. And and yeah, I, yeah amazing. Anyway. I'll get to my question. Um, Paul, um, what tips can you give as a lawyer to groups like ours? Um, is there like a, I don't know, anything? Um, because what you said about CRT, oh my God, the just the insanity of what groups like that and organizations like that say, very recent example, Natural England wouldn't let me plant trees on a piece of land, but they are allowing a 200 meter bridge to be built across a triple SI. So any tips, please. Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a broad question. I just want to say, as soon as I heard Fringe of the World's Hub, I want to say just thank you. Can we just like say thank everyone say thank you? <laughs> I've seen what you've been up to on Twitter and that your litter pit, some of the biggest I've ever seen in London, the amount of rubbish that group is getting out of the, of the, of the waters is incredible. And just what you are doing is, show, is speaking to other people and showing your love. That is, yeah. that is a lot. That's already showing so much. In terms of dealing with, dealing with um, institutions, you know, with that, if it's potentially going to damage an SSSI, don't do it. But if you're sure that what you're going to do is a good thing, do it and dare them to stop you. So for instance, on the roading, we've got loads of metal sheet piling and you're supposed to put in like, you know, tens of thousands of pounds applications to, to remove the sheet piling and naturalize it. I've just gone in the last couple of weeks, harvested willows from the roading for free and plonked them in all the way along. They're going to grow. There's nothing that EA can do about it. And what are they going to do? What are they going to do? So just basically be sure what you're doing is good for nature and then just do it. <laughs> And I think we're just about, are we going to lose you, Raj? You've, you've got to go. <laughs> um, we, we so enjoyed your contribution. What we hope is that we can create a some longer event where we can hear a lot more in detail um, some of your, uh, about some of your work as well. But Thank yeah, so because much. that was incredible that you came for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, who else in the room? Somebody? I know, I, I know I've been called up at some point. I'd like to do like a one or two minutes more to respond to something Richard said in a positive way. But when, when yeah, spoke, well, yeah, let, let's right. have, sure. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's go for any other speakers. Brilliant. We, we've still, we, we can carry on for another call. Yes. Okay. So I think when we talk about these concepts. Keep, of... keep it close to your mouth. 
uh, neoliberalism, global north, uh, colonialism. We forget that it's a lot more fragmented than we sometimes think. These are not homogeneous categories. And I think what uh, cool. what you said cool. is 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 really relevant. We have to recognize that we have our own knowledge and culture, even if some of it or well, a lot of it has been lost. But like the historical study he showed, there's still a lot of it available. And things are not so simple. They really, really uh, you 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 find these intersections of so-called modern and non-modern at all scales. You see it here in the UK. You see it in Portugal. I'm from Portugal. And for example, I, I heard you saying uh, UK is the biggest worst example export. I would say, for example, that England, in terms of law, uh, natural law, even though she gave a good example there, and activism is so much behind the UK. I'll give you one simple example. I come from ecology. Until this day, and this applies to the rest of Europe, we still use the same survey as being developed, I think, in 2003 in the UK, which is the River, ha the river Habitat Survey. Mm -hmm. And that's what's used till this day in all of Europe. So <laughs> it, it, it's a very simple thing. And you'd be thinking, first of all, how come this hasn't been updated? Like, haven't we learned something since then? And how come we, we don't see that uh, each country developing it out its own way of looking at it through? Because, for example, the River Habitat Survey uh, it, it's a brilliant method, but makes no sense in Portugal. It talks about land use categories that simply don't exist in Portugal and misses out a lot of land use categories that exist in Portugal. So, what is happening there? And I can tell you, uh, I come from a family that has fought against uh, dam projects in Portugal, uh, very large dam projects. One of them was stopped, the Foz do Coa. Uh, uh, now there's recognized a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and there's a big rewilding project over there. And uh, I can tell you, Portugal is still in the midst of completely and utterly destroying all its riverine habitats. One of its last wild rivers was Sabor, and we put it down. In it. And the fact that there was a European protected area designated in that area um, had no impact at all. And so we can't say things are modern capitalists and stuff like that, because it's, for example, European law, I'm particularly skeptical as a Portuguese of certain things that come from. Europe. Nevertheless, this is good law. The, the river habitat survey is a good starting point for looking at rivers. Uh, and yet so much has been destroyed. And here in the UK, I think you guys sometimes don't value the activism mm -hmm. you have. You know, we don't have this kind of activism. I, I, I'm, I'm part of a group that maybe for the whole of North of Portugal, we're just a dozen. We mean up each other and we can barely do anything, you know. It is really hard to do anything. Uh free cuttings in cities happen all over the place and it's in a massive scale. We can't stop it at all. And and you have you hear ridiculous, sorry if I'm taking very long, it's just you hear ridiculous arguments like and it, it's not even economic, it's not even capitalistic, it's just insane. You hear arguments like I'm cutting the trees because I want to protect human life. Because the tree is going to fall on someone and I'm protecting human life. Things like this. This is a local uh, uh, local authority saying this. So uh, things are not so straightforward. You have a lot of things here in the UK to value. We have a lot of things to value in Portugal. There's a lot to value in the global south and such. And, such. and I think one thing we have to realize is that at all levels, we have this mix of modern and non-modern within us. And within us, our knowledge uh, is a mix. There's no such thing as saying capitalist, north, capitalist, all this stuff. It makes no sense because it also denies one thing. We have also been subjected to capitalism. We have also been subjected to industrialism. We have also been subjected to massive 
infrastructure projects that destroy our environment massive at a scale that you don't see in some other countries. Portugal has completely okay. been destroyed by all sorts of infrastructure but, projects. Thanks. We we probably got time for about three or four more contributions. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, we're, I know that Paulina wants to say something. Paul also wanted to talk to Richard's point of view. And are there some other? Chris, were you going to speak? Were you, or did you want to speak? No? Okay. Paulina, why don't you say some more? And then we'll ask Paul and Chris if you want to say yeah. Yeah, I was just, thank you for also talking about rivers again in this way, and I just wanted to say I've really been enjoying that as this overarching theme, especially because, of course, recently we've been hearing more and more and more, it's it's not just floods, which of course, it's, it's all floods and droughts, but I, I never quite anticipated or I didn't know that climate change, that the first thing we're really talking about the most is, or sorry, I should say we and everything, but here at the moment, drought is the big theme and, and, and rivers potentially drying out or not flowing anymore. And that is now happening in so many places. I mean, what you just said in Portugal, Colorado River, in uh, Italian rivers, in, in Germany, the, the Rhine transport not even working anymore. All these things are happening right now. And we, I, I yeah, so I just wanted to raise that. It's actually, let's continue thinking and talking about rivers. I don't know, that's, that's all I meant to say. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> let's stop. Thanks, Pauline. And um, did Paul, Paul? Did you want to talk yeah. to Richard? Yeah, I was just to say. I mean, I I really uh, loved Richard's talk. It was something I'd never thought of yeah. before, and is actually really beautiful. Um, but it made me remember that I forgot to say something, which is um, the importance of deeply local knowledge and activism for combating shifting baseline syndrome. Which I think we all know what that is, right? So shifting baseline syndrome is this idea that um, as the environment gets worse, every generation just gets used to the environment in their time. So we actually have no idea what we've lost and how rich and beautiful nature once was. But actually, although we can understand that concept on an intellectual level, I believe that the main way of fighting it is on a hyper local level where you can actually truly understand what you've lost. So about, about a month ago, I was sat in a local plan meeting for Newham and they're basically saying, yeah, Newham's got um, some of the worst access to wild space in London. Um, and there's nothing we can really do about that because it's just a really built up area for the poor people. So what, what are you going to do? And I basically went back to the ancient maps. There's a map from 1890, just before they built most of the suburbs of London in the east. And there's huge areas of what were once marshes, some of the richest, most beautiful tidal marshes in the country, huge areas of them that were then built over. But there's one area here, which used to have a thing called the Back River did some historical research and it was actually filled in in the 1920s. But I went for a walk along it one day and found out that actually the entire route, although it had been filled in, was still undeveloped. So I quickly put together a load of maps and the thing of why they should redig it again and with some pictures of the route and then put it on Twitter with a story about how, how can we resurrect the ghost river of East Ham and bring it back to life and what a unique opportunity that was. And here's the email from the local plan department if you want to support this plan. <laughs> <laughs> and they got loads of people, probably too many. I think they got a bit annoyed actually. Just emailing them, and hopefully that's now going to go in the local plan to resurrect that that ghost river, right? So wherever you are, like, and that that comes from both looking at the maps, but also detailed knowledge of what your area is, what still remains, what tiny scraps of nature there are. You can then advocate that to get rid of that shifting baseline syndrome, and we get used to this denuded, mm. happy nature that we have. Can I can I respond to that? Yeah, Richard. Yes. Yeah, because um, I mean I restricted myself because of the time. Just uh, talking uh, about the the environmental uh, information contained in in what we call major place names. So you know, village or town names, parish names. Uh, but as as you've discovered, Paul, you know, behind underneath those there are hundreds hundreds of thousands of small minor names of fields and 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 parts of, of, of fields that we can draw upon potentially I mean it, it's it's an enormous uh, piece of undertaking to actually collect all these names over time but they really give you the fine detail uh, to enable us to to, to really think about uh, flora fauna topography former river channels uh, and the like um, in 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 um, minute detail a remarkable resolution over over long periods of time um, and um, 
uh, we need a kind of an army. We need we need kind of citizen science to collect this oh, this really? data and and then start 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 to to apply it and think about what it's actually telling us about um, how these places have changed um, over over time. The other the other thing that 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 I might mention is that I think we're all probably very aware that um, in our efforts to to um, rise to the challenges of 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 climate change. Uh, uh, um, and, and the like, we're going to have to recon reconfigure the landscape uh, and remodel and reshape it in, in a variety of, of ways. And that's going to be hard. Uh, this is a bit like your shifting, um, shifting baseline syndrome, um, because people think that the landscape that they live in has been there forever. And they, they can be, I mean, they, they can be very upset if you suggest that it ought to change in its character. I'm thinking about how people respond to the idea of putting large stands of trees back into a, a landscape. But it seems to me that if you can say, well, you're living in a place where once people identified with trees, or you, you, you say you're living in a place where people once identified with the river closely, I think the, um, our, our, our opportunities to advocate and to change people's minds or, or to, to open their minds to, to the idea of a new configuration of the landscape would probably be made easier. Hmm. Thank you, Richard. Magda, do you want to have a uh, maybe the last word? Did you want to talk at all, Chris? Or... No, just just last a thirty-second one. one. So, so uh, I'll leave space for Chris. What I wanted to say is that um, what what I learned from some of the talks today is that archives and past practices are not only markers of the past, but also could become prefigurative practices that perhaps signal regenerative futures, what uh, Pauline was mentioning. And I think it is about learning how to work, for example, with maps, with place names, and be a little bit more radical in terms of, it's not only about archiving, but also unarchiving and, you know, putting the willow back in. And I really, I really loved how these talks came together in this way as a call for action and for prefigurative practices. Thanks, thanks very much, Magda. That, that's a lovely summation. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything, well, contribute anything? Because um, I mean, just on shifting baseline syndrome, <laughs> I mean, it's just such a useful, powerful concept. Um, Harry's right to roam. I mean, it's like the part of the shifting baseline syndrome is you, nobody, in the, nobody in the city like London has ever kind of seen the Milky, Milky Way. Way. No. Um, when we had um, had some people over to stay with me in Hackney, they said, well, have you even got, got the moon? moon? I mean, because they felt really, they, they were feeling sick because they couldn't do epimy, the dark moon ritual. But, and they, they said, we've seen a few projections of the moon and a few, and a, you know, a couple of slides, but where is it? So, I mean, I, you know, I, yes. And I, I don't know, it's just that one of the things that anth radical anthropology how we defined ourselves when we first established ourselves. We, 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 we defined ourselves as doing reverse anthropology in so many ways, because of course, anthropology be began, um, especially sort of you know, institutionalized anthropology as, as like, how do we get savages? How do we get <laughs> people in Africa and everywhere else to, to develop? And, um, and we used to say, and it's still relevant, well, yeah, development, that's a really, useful idea, a really good idea. We in London and elsewhere in the West, we really need to be developed on a moral level, <laughs> I don't know, spiritual, so many levels we need to be developed and it's like the other way around. We need to, be, to allow indigenous people all around the world, all these people with local knowledge to help us to develop sufficiently to be able to, to survive into the future. I thought this evening's combination of talks was completely magical so I've obviously opened a huge like window of thoughts. Mm. I will just say one other thing, perhaps if I could, just in the time left. When we when we established radical anthropology, one of the one of the things we all thought was, how is it and why is it that children that go to school don't even know that there is such a thing as anthropology? And it just as soon as we started thinking about it, we said, oh yes, of course, because the kids are taught a thing called geography, another thing called history, another thing called religious studies. 
And the critical point is that young people should not join up the dots. They shouldn't be able to get a glimpse of kind of the big picture, because if, if kids had a, at that age, had a glimpse of the big picture, they just wouldn't be, they wouldn't put up with the kind of narrow boxes into which they're going to be put through the rest of their lives, because of course school is a kind of initiation right into this particular narrow culture. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose just the one of the thoughts I've been having all along is, yes, of course, it's the local knowledge, the indigenous knowledge, in, 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 it's so lovely to hear it come, come, bounce back into this country about yes. local knowledge, but 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 still a, a big question is how do we connect up those local knowledges that still is pretty important it's to, to stay too local and not to kind of feel that we can connect and up with each other that is the perfect note to end on <laughs> very brilliant question so and i've just been i've just been having a look through the chat and there are so many interesting conversations going on in the chat about um about tree planting and different ways of thinking about the land and memories of place names and i just also want to extend such gratitude to all of you well, all of you for being here and being here on zoom and all of our speakers for just bringing together these fascinating you know debates and questions and experiences all of your activisms and practices of these very um, you know these these very local forms of knowledge wherever people are working and acting and living in the world so thank you all so much and thank you to Rad for you know inviting me and Paulina to to help bring this together and, and, and collaborate we have the Wonderful. hope we have the hope <laughs> that this is not going to be the only such event and that it's we might be able to do something with more with more time, which might involve workshops and ideas that are, you know, of of getting out there into landscapes to, to uh, you know, really um, start to create those those connections because which are happening, evidently in our own landscapes in urban uh, landscapes of London and further across the country. Um, so there's so much more to be done. That that is why we have tried to collect people's um names to keep contacts and we hope that there's going to be some future if that seems like a good idea because we've hardly we've hardly kind of opened up the ground here we've only just made start. an initial <laughs> an initial there dig in there it's just a little start um so thank you very much for, helen's already said thank you to everyone on zoom and i'm going to just say something about uh, the next two weeks of rag for people's information um, next week, we are Zoom only, and Chris, who just spoke then, will be talking about an Australian sacred myth, which is about the Australian landscape of Arnhem Land, um, of, the, uh, uh, of the Yongu people, the Wawalak story. Um, the following week after that, we have a very exciting talk also from Lucy Cook, the author of Bitch, on uh, the evolution of female strategies. So this is very um evolutionary feminist perspective um so lucy hey. cook will be live here <laughs> lucy cook will be live here but also on zoom so zoom only next week um live in two weeks and that will be our last talk before easter uh i just should fly that helen is going to be talking <laughs> for us after easter we had to move her date because of the ucu strike action but she will be speaking uh, cross fingers, April the 25th. Um, so come back absolutely for, for Helen's um, talk yeah. on that date. Um, and thank you everybody on Zoom. I'm going to say wave goodbye and say thank you to everybody. Um, goodbye to everybody here for, on your and behalf. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end off now and we'll say goodbye to you.